Hi EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast episode number 26. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I've started this podcast because I believe that companies have to think of themselves as employment brands if they hope to attract and retain talent. The podcast brings a different lens to the employee experience, a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests are thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way come to this show to debate, discuss and share best practices on the key components that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture and also to spark the conversation on how to create positive employee experiences. One size doesn't fit all. What Airbnb or Google do around the employee experience may simply not be applicable in a smaller company. And this is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes, not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or a large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Katie Van Horn, speaking with me from Scottsdale, Arizona. Katie is the Vice President of Global Engagement and Inclusion at GoDaddy. She's also a professional coach at Bar The Door. Today with Katie, we will talk about how GoDaddy faced a brand perception challenge between its consumer brands versus its employer brands, what diversity means at GoDaddy and how the company has built a diversity strategy. How HR must partner with marketing and other departments to collectively create an employee experience strategy, and how to build an HR roadmap to address the cultural shift to become a more people centric organization. This week's EX podcast is sponsored by Structural. Structural unleashes the potential of people and teams by giving organizations real-time mobile access to employee data. Find, engage, and retain talents with the Structural Employee Success Platform. EX Podcast listeners can visit structural.com slash EX Podcast to get access to the latest employee experience resources including the Employee Success Playbook featuring 10 research-backed methods to improve business outcomes. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Katie. If you get a chance, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes. You can open the iTunes app and type in Stefan Vincent or EX Podcast and you will find us there. And last thing, if you want to send me feedback, suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. All right, let's get to it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX podcast. Very excited for today's guest, Katie Van Horn from the Phoenix area. Katie is the Vice President of Global Engagement and Inclusion at GoDaddy. She's also a professional coach at Bar The Door. Katie, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. So for those who don't know you, tell us a bit more about your background and your current role at GoDaddy. Absolutely. So I've been with GoDaddy for a little over six and a half years and have kind of moved up the ranks. Now I actually lead our diversity and inclusion efforts and really focus on how to make sure we have a great employee experience, make sure we are, have a really inclusive environment for our employees so they can do the best work of their lives. Let's Talk first about the GoDaddy customer brands versus the employer brands. I'd say that probably in the public's minds, GoDaddy has been associated with Danica Patrick and other racy commercials a few years back. However, when Blake Irvin joined the company as CEO, GoDaddy has gone through what we could call a cultural shift. 
And what it, what was it like to go through this change, especially from an employer brand perspective? I, I think for for me specifically and for our HR group, it was a great shift. And the reason why I, I really believe that it was so impactful was it really, really helped us match our external brand to who we are internally. So we've always had a really great culture at GoDaddy. And this just helped us, you know, to, to move away from those commercials that weren't really showing our products or what we were doing at GoDaddy to move to something that was really all about the small business owner and really focused on how we're helping those small business owners get online. That just makes me proud. And I'm really excited to be a part of that change and a part of the shift that we're now really focused on doing great work for small business owners. What were some of the steps that had to happen internally to be able to shift that the public perception of the brand itself? You know, I think it was really a, a team effort that we had. All of the teams focused on shifting our external marketing and shifting the, the way that we were perceived in the market. So, for example, um, we had Blake Irving, actually, our, our CEO, went to Grace Hopper in 2014 and was on a male allies panel. That panel was not well received by the attendees at Grace Hopper because they, they didn't want to hear from someone that they believed kind of repped a company that wasn't great for women. And he then went back in 2015 to Grace Hopper as a keynote and talked about the fact that we have definitely changed and we have really started to focus a lot more on our, again, our external marketing matching who we are internally. So our commercials and where we're showing up and all of the things that we're doing, we're truly focused on that small business owner. And people really saw that shift. And I'll tell you, you know, from a recruiting perspective, The shift from 2014, where the recruiters were struggling to get people to come to the booth, to 2015 after Blake's keynote, people were flocking to the booth and wanted to hear more about what we were doing and, and what we were building at GoDaddy. Uh, historically, the technology industry has been mostly driven by male, or at least you, know, you have more male workers than you have female workers. So has it been an issue with GoDaddy to try to, to attract the female talents to the organization, given the, the brand perception of the public and the fact that technology is a male-dominated industry? Yeah, I, I think it's historically it's an issue and currently it's an issue that you know there aren't as many women in Um, the workforce in engineering that we would like to have. And so it is a constant struggle to give the opportunities and make sure we have an inclusive environment where women also feel comfortable and everyone feels comfortable coming and working at GoDaddy and, and really doing great work, building cool stuff. So the, the shift that we've tried to make, and I think that a lot of tech companies are trying to make, is to build these inclusive environments. So, you know, the old adage around diversity and inclusion was you recruit a bunch of diverse candidates and then you, you know, bring them into the company. That has really shifted, and now it's a situation where it's not about how many numbers you can recruit. It's about what's the environment like once they get on board because you can recruit all you want, But if you don't get them to stay because the environment's not inclusive and not great for them, they'll leave. And so I think that shift has been something that we all, you know, at GoDaddy really understand. And so we really focused on, on making the inclusive environment live and real for people. How we did that, we really focused on, you know, kind of the employee life cycle and making sure that, you know, everyone has a career path that everyone has the, the same promotion opportunities and advancement opportunities. So it wasn't about, you know, giving women a leg up or giving minorities a leg up. It was truly about making it consistent and fair for everyone. So everyone felt like they have the same opportunities to move up the ranks and move into whatever career they want to at GoDaddy. How many employees do you guys have at GoDaddy? So uh, globally, we have about 6,300, and in the U.S., uh, we have around, um, I think, right around 5,000, a little over 5,000. And wh how would you compare the ratio of males versus females uh, at GoDaddy uh, compared to the industry average? 
So we are at 26% uh, female population, and we, we actually just announced our numbers recently, and the focus we're trying to take and that we continue to take is really around building not just our numbers, but building you know, the the female leadership representation, because we really do feel like, you know, if you have women and have um, persons of color in higher ranking roles, they're able to drive more recruiting and drive more efforts around this because, A, you know, if if someone is sitting in an entry-level role and they can see that someone in the C-suite looks like them and has similar experiences, similar experiences that they've had, it's a lot easier to, to think of themselves in that role. Um, and so we really, we look at the numbers, we focus on the numbers and we focus on that kind of senior level because we want to grow that population and make sure that we have the right ratios and the right leadership to make products for our very diverse customer base. So let's talk a bit further around diversity and inclusion because both are intertwined. And obviously, you want a diverse. I mean, it's not you want, but you know, when a company wants a diverse workforce, the company has to make sure that actually um, the inclusion happens in all the layers of the company. So, what does what does GoDaddy do well in terms of bringing a diverse? workforce to the organizations and ensure that there is a strong enough inclusion so that people from different backgrounds, whether it's gender, it's um, ethnicity, um, even sexual orientation, or even just background in general, how, can, how do you guys allow promotions and career path within the organization? So it's a great question. So what we've really done is we looked at our promotion process and we looked at the kind of the different cyclical processes that we do at GoDaddy. And I think the one that we really wanted to change, and we actually partnered with the Clayman Institute at Stanford, we we looked at how do we actually evaluate our employees' performance. And so, you know, a lot of companies use a nine box. And within that nine box, the way that it's looked at is, you know, you look at performance and potential. And that potential piece kind of it brings in a lot of bias and allows a lot of bias from the leader and from the, the team. And so we switched and we really focus on performance but then we also focus on their values. So, you know, how are they living our values? How are they really bringing themselves to work every day? And I think that shift was kind of our, our first step. We then continue to kind of look at how can we block bias from this performance review process? So making sure our values really were reflective of what we wanted our employees to do at work and, and how they how we wanted them to show up at work. We really focused on how to make sure that managers didn't have as much of that bias creeping in and could look at a process like the mid-year and you know annual review and have really great guidelines to describe, you know, what is a high, medium, low performer on these different pieces. So we, we make it very simple for the leader and for the employee to understand so that everyone's on the same page, everyone gets kind of how they're doing. So that was kind of the one of the big one of the big pieces that we shifted and changed. The other piece is we actually do a promotion flagging for our leaders. And what that means is at different intervals of their, you know, their uh, career, we look at the time that they're in role and then it flags for the leader if it's time for them to be kind of reviewed for a promotion. So for example, someone that is a level one accounting clerk they will at 12 months be reviewed for a a promotion and we'll ask the manager, you know, Hey, if this person isn't ready for promotion, what feedback have you given them? How do they, you know, what do they know to basically move to that next level? So that's been really great because it's been something that the leaders can understand and follow. Then, you know, level two, it's 18 months and on and on kind of throughout their career. Cause obviously as they move higher in their levels, there is a little bit more time that they need to spend in role to really be an expert. And that's something we do across the board. Now, when we announced our numbers, we did announce that women, we had a 30% increase in promotion for women. 
The cool part, though, is that there was no decrease in promotion for men. So this wasn't a takeaway for men. And, you know, we want to make sure that it truly is about consistent and fair processes. So that increase in promotions for women was just the right thing to do. But it didn't take away or in any way, you know, kind of block men from also being promoted, which is a great that's a great thing. And is the process, the promotion, the promotion process, is it something that is trans, or how transparent it is for other employees? Do they know exactly what, uh, what steps they have to take in order to be promoted at some point? Absolutely. So we actually have a, what we, what we call leveling guides and it's basically kind of a, almost similar to like a job description. However, it's really based on, you know, what skills do they need to exhibit on a regular basis to move to that next level? And those are laid out for our most populated roles. So a, an engineer can look at their leveling guide and know, here's where I need to be operating at to move to that next level. And they can take that to their leader and show their leader, hey, you know, I'm doing these things, not as a, a checklist of, hey, I did this one time, but on an ongoing basis, if they're really focused on what we've asked them to focus on, then it's it's time for them to get a promotion, which is great. So they absolutely do know what they need to do and what they need to exhibit to move to that next level. And what kind of resources do employees have at their disposal to be able to address some of their areas where uh, areas of improvement? We do a lot of, of training and development. So we have an amazing learning and development team and we have set classes for, you know, for our engineers and for our product teams and for other folks to make sure that they can, um, be, you know, kind of get the education, get the certifications, get whatever it is that they need to move to that next level. And then we also make sure that there's tuition reimbursement. There are, you know, outside conferences and certifications that they can do to continue to build that, that strength and that kind of lifetime learning concept for all of our employees. How do you measure the um, effectiveness of uh, this process? So, or do you have the, metrics in place to monitor the the, the, the um, career path and promotion path of employees? Well, I think the the number that we are probably most proud of this year is really that that increase in promotion for women. Mm -hmm. We increased it by thirty percent. And, you know, when we looked at the increase in even, you know, underrepresented minorities, it has grown as well. And so that was one kind of key lever that we wanted to, to track and a metric that we wanted to keep an eye on to see if this really was changing how people were thinking about promotions as leaders and, and make sure we were giving more opportunities. We don't just want to have the squeaky wheel get the promotion. We want everyone to have the opportunity to move and grow. Obviously, building an EX strategy, in my opinion, should be, shouldn't be necessarily an HR responsibility, at least solely, but rather collective cross-functional efforts between marketing, human resources, talent acquisition, maybe operations, and of course, leadership. What that means is that for HR is that HR professionals have uh, to become uh, good HR partners with the rest of the organization. So how does it work at GoDaddy? Do you see a lot of collaboration between HR and other teams, maybe marketing to work on the employer brands? Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. It's one of those situations where we absolutely have to have partnership and we have to be kind of in the mix on these conversations. A, to know what's going on. So, you know, as an HR team, we want to listen to um, – We want to make sure we're listening to the feedback that we're getting for, from our employees so we can improve experiences as they come up. And we want to make sure that we're really focused on, you know, working with the business leaders because it, it, you're right. It isn't an HR process or an HR thing. It's a business thing. And it's the right business decision to make sure we have these things in place. Having a diverse workforce It has been proven time and again at different organizations that the more diverse your organization, the better numbers and bottom line results you're going to get. 
So this isn't a nice to have anymore. This is a, a business imperative and working with all of the teams across the board to make sure that, you know, our, a, a great example is our, you know, our candidate value proposition has to match our employee value proposition. So when our recruiters are going out and talking about the job and working at GoDaddy and what's that, what that's like, it has to match what actually happens when they get onto a team working on whatever project they might be working on, that has to match or you'll see a ton of attrition. And luckily, you know, the recruiting team and all of us in HR, I think really have focused and have really worked with our leaders to make sure that it does match. And it is something that we're proud of and we want employees to be excited about coming to work every day. So let's talk about a little bit about talent acquisition and recruiting then, because obviously technology as a whole is a very competitive landscape when it comes to attracting top talents. Mm-hmm. And so the good that is based in Phoenix, it's not that far away from California and the Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. But, but do you have a pool of talents big enough in Phoenix to recruit only local people or do you compete with a silicon-based company and try to get those people move to the Phoenix area or maybe work remotely, but for GoDaddy? So I, I, a little bit of everything, and, and here's why. We actually have an office in Sunnyvale, California. We have an office in L.A. We have an office in San Francisco. We have an office in Seattle. We have an office in Cambridge. So we really kind of built our offices around where those talent pools are. So yes, we absolutely love having people move to Arizona and enjoy this, you know, the beautiful weather of Arizona. Mm -hmm. However, we also wanted to make sure that we were going after the talent and the best talent that we could find. And so building in those other markets just made good business sense. So that's what we've done. So, you know, looking at the different locations that we wanted to build out and grow, it's been really important that, you know, you're right. There is a, a not as much talent in Phoenix, and we're to, you know change that and, and grow that engineering talent from you know grade school and beyond. But in the meantime, we're really focused on going into markets that make sense to find the right people. Yeah, that, that does make a lot of, a lot of sense actually. What is the other big question is really about around the um, employee engagements and measurements. Right. Yes. There's there are a lot of initiatives that companies try to implement when it comes to better engage with the employees. But the most challenging part of it is how do you measure the the return of investments and somehow how do you measure the impact on the business outcomes? Do you, do you have anything like this where you're able to measure and analyze the impact on the business has come from uh, an EX and an employee engagement perspective? Absolutely. So we do an annual survey on employee engagement, and that is a very comprehensive survey that we do with our employee base. And the the piece that I say to every HR person that I possibly can and to every business leader that I possibly can is an employee engagement survey is only as good as the results that you take action on. Right. And so, you know, it's great to survey your employees and th- see how things are going. But unless you take action, which I feel like we've really done a good job of, it's it's for naught. So we really have, have focused, and a great example that I can give you is that um, our call center here in Arizona and, and our Iowa offices, they were struggling. And we made some changes to the leadership team and, and made some changes to some of the policies and procedures to make sure that you know, what we heard from our employees and the feedback that they gave us that we took action on it. And that's just been a great win because people really understand that this is no longer just about, hey, you go fill out a survey every year. We truly make changes and do things that we can to improve that experience that employees are having. Now, now, as you're a software company, something that is somehow fascinating to me is the fact that there are a lot of comparison uh, between uh, between the way we build softwares and the way we should build employee experiences, meaning that on the software side, it's always about you know, launching a first version of the product, getting mm-hmm. some feedback from the market, making some innovations, 
you yep. know, launching the second version and so forth and so forth. So it's ne it's never an ended product. It's always a, um, a, a product that is going to evolve based on market needs and some bugs and issues that are fixed. Uh, and in my mind, it should be the same on the employee experience. Nothing is going to work 100% right away. So do you guys have seen some things that didn't work well or some things that did work well and and that you've made changes along the way? Absolutely. And I think that's been one of the, the reasons why some of the work that we've done has been successful is we've definitely gone with the, you know, kind of the agile software development process yeah. and, you know, gone out with an MVP and, and said, how does this look? How does this feel? How is it working? And when it's not working or it's not quite right, we make changes and we, you know, continue to iterate to make sure it's the right thing for us. And I think that's important for every organization to understand and, and realize that sometimes you don't get it right. And sometimes, you know, you get it 80% right, but it's the iteration and getting that feedback from your customers, your employees, and, and making sure you make changes based on that feedback. That's how you really improve the employee experience. And, and that is also how we build products. So it's, it's the right way to, to build out your employee experience. And in my mind, you have to experiment and see what works. Right. I, I would agree with you completely on this. So let me ask you this question. How do you build an HR roadmap to address the necessary cultural shift to be a more people-centric organization? So, yeah, that's actually what I do in my, uh, my consulting business is I, I work with HR teams to focus on their HR roadmap. And the way I think about it is, you know, think about three years in the future. What do you want things to look like? How do you want that to, to look and feel for your employees? And keeping that, you know, that customer always in mind and the customer there is our employee and kind of work back from there. So it's an iterative process. Absolutely. But there are some things that every company can say, this is what I want us to end up at. And this is where I want us to go. And so being able to kind of work back from there of what can you actually do with the current team you have, with the resources that you have, with the headcount you have and looking at that in an incremental change I think it's a great way to to really realize a good roadmap and make sure that you're still building on what you're trying to do with your organization. I don't think you can flip a switch, and I don't know any HR organization that has the, the resources to flip a switch and fix everything. So you do have to think about it in a longer, kind of longer term and in sprint mentality. So going back to the software development perspective, you have to take those sprints that, you know, hey, what are we going to improve in the next six months? What are we going to improve in the next year? And then make it an iterative process that you're always getting better and you're always improving, but you're not going to be able to do it all at the same time. So that's when I think about a roadmap and think about how I, I work with different HR teams. It's really about where do you want to go and what are the 10 or 15 steps you need to take before you get there? Yeah. I've I've had the opportunity to interview uh, on on the podcast different people in places where they lead uh, global diversity inclusion employer branding and interestingly and that's probably because it's the angle that I'm taking with the podcast but uh, many of them have come from a marketing consumer marketing background and they moved into more of a HR talent acquisition employer brands management role. Do you see this, um, first of all, do you have anything like this at GoDaddy? And do you see a shift where people from a truly marketing background are going to move more into HR roles to bring that sort of customer-focused, customer-centric uh, perspective? Absolutely. So we actually have an employee brand team, and they work very closely with our marketing and social media teams because it goes hand in hand yes. and that kind of goes back to the, you know, the, the candidate value proposition and going into different, uh, you know, recruiting conferences or recruiting arenas. If you're marketing, if your employee brand, if all of those don't match, then you're not going to be able to recruit the people that you want to recruit. If you're not showing up at the diverse conferences at the places where you want to find this talent, you're not going to find it. And so 
there absolutely has to be a, a very close bond between employee brand marketing and the leadership team, quite honestly, because everyone has to be working together to move this forward. So do you actually have marketing people, people from a marketing background working on your team? So uh, kind of the opposite. We have our employee brand team has a, a dotted line report into our marketing team. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, and that, again, that just is really to ensure that alignment between what we're going out and talking about as a brand, as a, you know, a product brand, mm -hmm. that it absolutely matches what we're talking about from an employee brand. And they, they work very closely together, and it's definitely something that, again, we iterate on as we change and grow and launch new products and different things like that. So to stay a little bit on the HR and marketing uh, subjects, again, what's interesting to me is organizations do very well uh, segmenting consumer or customer markets, right? And they have different products to address the needs of different market segments. But they, yet they tend to, to treat employees as the same bunch, even though you may have different groups based on the generation there, they belong to maybe, um, you know, again, different ethnical backgrounds, uh, gender, whatever. So do you have any sort of segmentation of your employees at GoDaddy? And do you have ways to cater some sort of benefits or the way they experience work? So I, I think that the, the one that I, we don't try to segment them, on, you know, for various reasons. And obviously we don't want to have some, you know, inconsistent process for one group versus a different group. because that would get weird and could lead to legal issues actually. But the way that we think about it is it's usually, and this is quite normal for a lot of organizations that split between hourly and, and exempt. Mm -hmm. So the non-exempt versus exempt, there are some things that are different and from a benefits perspective, We really try to make sure that we have benefits for all of the different groups, depending on where they are in their life. And what I mean by that is, you know, we recently updated our parental leave to make sure that we were not just focused on women who are having a baby, but on non-traditional families and letting dads take time as well and making sure that everyone really had that opportunity to, to take time to bond with a new baby. So for us, it's, it truly has been not a let's segment and not be inclusive. It's been let's bring more people into the mix and be more inclusive. That does make sense, totally. Um, now, we're getting close to the end, but at this time in the podcast, I typically like to ask a bit more personal questions so that our listeners can get to know our guest a bit more intimately. Okay. So that was a bit more a uh, fun question. So the first question would be, if you were to invite a, a historical figure to dinner, who would you choose and why? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> well, the first one that comes to mind that I think would just be fun and interesting to talk to is Oprah Winfrey, but I, that's probably a lot of people's answer. Um, historical figure, quite honestly, I think like any of the – first women. So anyone who was a, a wife of a president, I think would be really fascinating to talk to and just hear what their impression of their kind of their legacy and what they helped build in the white house from the, from the, you know, the wife of uh, position. I think that would be really fun to, to talk to any of them. Okay, what's this essential item that you always take with you on vacation? A Kindle. A Kindle. Gotta have books. <laughs> All right, what kind of books do you read? Um, everything and anything. I, I am not, I'm not particular. I like to read um, autobiographies. I like to read um, historical uh, fiction. I like to read nonfiction. So I'm kind of all over the place. And I recently have been doing a lot of reading on coaching and how to, you know, do better to how to help leaders do better. And so, you know, taking on that more of the coaching role, really trying to hone my skill set. 
Okay, just a, a couple of other questions. The, the the third one is, what is your favorite vacation spot? Um, it's a toss up. Anywhere on a beach is probably the right answer, but I do like Cabo San Lucas, and I do like um, a very very small town in Mexico called San Carlos. Okay. Yeah, and I would guess the beach would make sense when you work and live in Phoenix. That's something yeah. that you don't have there. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Got to get to the water. Absolutely. <laughs> and finally, what is your favorite food? My favorite food? I think I would say... Um, sushi. I would go sushi. Okay. <laughs> well, what is the way for our listeners to follow you and GoDaddy on social media? Um, so I am on Twitter as at Katie Bar 7, and that's K-A-T-E-E-B-A-R and the number 7. You can follow GoDaddy at GoDaddy.com or at GoDaddy. And I'm also, I have a website where I blog and talk a lot about HR and all kinds of fun stuff, and that's KatieVanHorn.com. All right, well, Katie, thank you, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks for sharing some insights on what GoDaddy does and your perspective on the the role of human resources and how the, the function has evolved over the years and where it's going forward. Absolutely. Glad to help. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.